This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship with Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Fargo, North Dakota on this July 14th. We continue with the last week of our uh, the Old Testament part of our series, The Good Book, with P is for Pua. And so we hear of this midwife during the time of the Hebrews living in Egypt and the bravery of her and her companion as they stood up to Pharaoh. Let us begin our worship service with this call to worship. I invite you to respond, come, let us worship. Come, wrestle with God who receives us and welcomes us just as we are. Come, let us worship. Come, look around with questions, look around with wonder, turning your head in every direction you can find. Come, let us worship. Come, God calls us into renewed relationships with one another. Come, let us worship. Come, God invites us into new beginnings. Come, let us worship. And so we gather together today in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in our time of confession and absolution. Let us pray. Gathered into one by God's Spirit, we are bold to confess our sins, our shortcomings, our failures, right here in the open, in the presence of God and of one another. Please take a moment of silence to reflect. God of grace, we confess that we have failed you, failed ourselves, failed one another. We assume the worst about those around us, rather than giving anyone the benefit of the doubt. We do the same to ourselves, and sometimes even, we do the same to you. We are stubborn and determined to hold a grudge. We fail to exercise our imaginations, fail to recognize your works waiting to be born, if only we would step up to help, or sometimes if we would move out of the way. Forgive us, O God, and show us another way forward. Amen. And so, beloveds, hear this good news of the risen Christ. God is making all things new. Your sins are forgiven. God's invitation is to another way of living. Thanks be to God. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray together our prayer of the day. O oh God, you invite us to be part of your new creation over and over again, and yet we doubt our own faith, our own abilities, our own witness. Give us clear minds, steady hands, strong stomachs, that we might stand tall in the face of fear, that we might recognize your call to disobedience in the face of evil. Amen. And so our scripture today comes to us from Exodus chapter 1. Glory to you, O Lord. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, 
every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be with each of you from God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. What does it mean to fear God? Typically, fear comes from a perceived consequence, a danger, a separation, a possible broken relationship or disappointment. Throughout Christian history, fear of God has been tied to judgment in an expectation of how we should be living. In his explanation of the Ten Commandments, Martin Luther begins each of his reflections with, we should fear and love God. So how do we live as those who fear and love God? And how will that fear affect the lives that we live, knowing that one day we will be judged by God? Jesus preached that the two greatest commandments are to love God and love your neighbor. And throughout his life on earth, he not only fulfilled those commandments himself, but taught his disciples and followers to do the same. When you die, God will not be comparing you to others. There are no extra points for being better than someone else. God's judgment is compassionate, it is grace-filled, and yet it is a very simple question. Did you love God and love your neighbor? These are the two greatest commandments and what all other law spawns from. How would our lives change if we measured our daily practices against these two laws? Do I fear and respect and love God in such a way that I am measuring my own love against God's standard, not the world's? And then, in lives centered in these commandments, what new things are birthed from that question? What beautiful new life enters this world when we fear God so deeply that we are constantly aware of our love for God and our love for our neighbor. In our text today, Pua and Shifra are midwives living in uh, Egypt during the time where the Israelites or the Hebrews were enslaved by the Egyptians. Just prior to our text today, Exodus chapter 1 lays out why Pharaoh wanted all of the baby boys dead. Joseph, who we talked about last week, the son of Jacob, also known as Israel, had served as the right-hand man to Pharaoh and had brought his family then to Egypt in the midst of the famine. Jacob ended up having 70 children in total. And so this was already a large group of Hebrews coming to Egypt. And then each of his children also had large families and multiplied, growing so much that they filled the land. Generations had passed since Joseph's time and enough history that had gone through that the new generation of Pharaoh did not remember who Joseph was and what Joseph had done for Egypt. Instead, this Pharaoh was increasingly aware of these aliens he believed were in his land, and that their numbers were increasing so much that if they kept populating in this way, they would be able to take over the Egyptians. And so in order to make sure that they stayed under Egypt's thumb and did not rise up against them in the event of war, the Pharaoh oppressed the Israelites into forced labor. But the more that they were oppressed, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread through Egypt. So much so that the Pharaoh responded by making their lives even more bitter with hard manual labor building their cities and temples and pyramids with brick and mortar, and also every other kind of field labor, ruthlessly punishing and dealing with them 
in order to keep them under their control. But this was still not enough, which brings us to our text today. Pharaoh still does not believe that the Egyptians are safe from the Israelites, and so he is cutting off their multiplication at the source. No male babies means no more generations of Israelites. A slow and less outright genocide, but would make a large impact in the years to come. Shifra and Pua have grown up under this wrath of Pharaoh, and all of their attempts, to, and all of his attempts to squelch this growing Hebrew population. They were on the front lines of it as midwives, literally bringing each new life in with their own hands and their own encouragement alongside the mother's labor. I cannot imagine what it must have felt like to hear this command from Pharaoh, the one who held their lives in his hand, and to be told essentially, it is your life or the baby's. Pharaoh said, even as you catch the baby from the mother, if it's a boy, immediately kill it. If it is a girl, you may let it live. I think the or else that was left out of our text today was also very much received by them. If Pharaoh was cruel enough to want to kill babies, I'm sure he would not have dealt kindly with these two midwives. But by God's grace, and their lie to Pharaoh, they were kept safe. Instead, Pharaoh found another way to carry out his horrid plan, charging the e Egyptians themselves with finding these baby boys and throwing them into the Nile River. And this begins the story of Moses. Pua and Shifra feared God. They did not fear Pharaoh. In the midst of a job that was messy and difficult and hope-giving and heart-wrenching, they knew what their call was in life. They knew their call was to offer their hands, their expertise, and their presence to bring new life into the world, and then to protect that life, even if it meant they may give up their own. Our call to Christians follows what could be similar to a midwife. Living as those who fear and love God means that our lives are frequently messy and require labor and attention and a steady constitution and a strong stomach. That is deep love for one another. A love that knows how difficult life can be and yet shows up to share God's love in the midst of it. Dr. Anna Carta Florence, in the book that we are using for this series, puts it this way in the chapter for this week's text. Fear must be matched with the correct object if we want the role. To fear God and not Pharaoh and his administration. To fear God and not the dark night of the soul. To fear God and not the anxiety of all you do not know in this world. A midwife who fears God sets those other fears aside and endeavors to see the big picture, which is that the empire will not have the last word. It will not define the new order. It will not poison us with new hate. The only power we answer to is the creator of the universe and the God of love. Because Shifra and Pua feared God, God gave them families. God gave them more people to love, more people to claim and claim them, more people who at the end of the day would take them into their lives and that they would have to take into, no matter who those people had been, what they had done, or how they had voted. God gave Pua and Shifra families that they may never have even chosen for themselves. If this is the case, then as midwives who also fear God, which families might God have in mind for us? God has given us this family 
the people of Bethlehem Lutheran Church in all their saint and sinnerness. God has also given us the people of our community and country. God has given us Christians and non-Christians and seekers and atheists in this beloved family. God has given us those who are difficult and controlling and racist and sexist and filthy rich and dirt poor, gaming obsessed, opiate addicted, abused, falsely accused, transitioning, kicked out of their homes and about to be fired or on the brink of divorce. All these are members of our family in God. And every one of them is laboring alongside us to become some new creation. Every one of them is ensuring us to have a long night and a lot to clean up, but also the gift of witnessing new life entering this world in the way that God continues to work through them. This family is wearing, yes, but to also clarify, love is also quite wearing. To fear and love God means that we can birth and help birth what God might be doing next. To fear God means that we are aware of what new thing God might be bringing to life in ways that are counter to our world and the fears of power in it. The exodus and liberation of the Israelite people began in this way. Moses and his brother Aaron were born out of these midwives not doing what Pharaoh had charged them to do. Even though they had no control over what was really happening or no understanding of what God was doing through this small disobedience. But they trusted and they feared God and that gave them courage against Pharaoh. What new life is God calling us to usher into this world? And will we also have the courage and fear of God to help bring it into being? Thanks be to God. Amen. We reflect on these words with the gift of special music.
Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love, through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to join me as we confess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so as people of faith who believe in the power of prayer, let us pray together for the church, the world, and all those in need. Please join me. Good and loving God, you gather your people into the body of Christ, calling us family. Where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is divided, reunite it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we ask that you are with the nations of this world, those who are in peace, those who are in times of war. God, we especially ask that you are with the children of yours and our extended family in Gaza and Palestine and Israel, those in Iran and Ukraine and Russia. God, we also ask that you are with the leadership of this country. May you give them ears to hear the cries of your children. May you give them your wisdom and your humility as they continue to make laws and decisions that affect this country. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, on the cross, your beloved Son endured pain and death. Bring healing to those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. We pray especially today for Lori Asmus, Ruth Asmus, Marvin Clemenson, Marie Fjellstead, Kristen Kelly, Kathy Kulink, Florence Mock, Augustus Nicklay, Alan Oak, Gloria Autumn, Margaret Sandsmark, Peggy Wolvatny, Maria Winters, and from our extended faith community, Charlotte Baumgardner, Jean Bolio, Mike Business, Cheryl Boyle, Peg Broughton, Alan Dolliver, Lorraine Flesness, Marge Getz, Kara Jacobson, Alan Knopp, Merle Matheson, Star Moss, Alan Pritchard, Kim Renner, Bette Seward, Jeff Schoberg, Josh Slend, Pam Strobel, Karina Tabor, Bob Walls, Monica Webster, and these we lift up from our own hearts in this time of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Receive then this benediction. As you go on your way, may Christ go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you.